Hello and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruvain speaking to you from south of Jerusalem here in the holy, beautiful land of Israel. Today is the 28th day of the month of Av, 5783. It's August 15th, 2023. This coming Shabbat, we read Parashat Shoftim, Judges. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter beginning chapter 16 verse 18 concluding chapter 21 verse 9 this coming wednesday evening begins the first day of a two-day rosh chodesh celebration uh, it, what's the word i want to use ushering in the new month of elul elul which is the final month of the year, the Hebrew year that begins with Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, it is the uh, sixth month of the year that begins with the month of Nisan, which of course is the month of Passover, the month of the exodus from Egypt. Israel, as you know, the Jewish calendar, as you know, has four different uh, New Year's. The most well-known and celebrated and many ways significant are, of course, that which begins in the month of Nisan, the month of Passover, the month of the Exodus, and that which begins in the month of Tishrei, uh, the month of uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shmini Yatzeret. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because this Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, is the beginning of the month of Elul, which is the lead-in to the high holidays and it is a very significant month a very beloved month in fact so beloved that it's Rashi Tevot um, it's four letters that it's spelled with in Hebrew Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed are I'm forgetting another word what's happening to me what's happening to my mind it is the initials of the Hebrew words Anila Dodi I am, I, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Uh, from the Song of Songs, of course, I believe it's chapter 6, verse 3, I believe. And that um, beautiful little statement of intimacy and mutual trust, honor, love, fidelity, respect is what it's all about. Uh, not only, of course, in our personal relations, but in the case of Elo, we're really thinking about our relationship with Hashem. And uh, he is our beloved. He, she, whoever you want to call Hashem. I'm not not getting specific here. God is beyond, beyond all that. He is our beloved and we are his beloved. And uh, that's the way it ought to be. And that's the way... It should be, and that's what we always strive for, and yearn for, and work for, and um, work on ourselves for, because we always need to work on ourselves, and in the month of Elul, we get super serious about that, because we want to be fully prepared um, for Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Judgment, Yom Kippur, the day that we stand before Hashem, and asked, asked basically for our slates to be cleaned. And, uh, and of course, the, after that, the celebration of Sukkot, etc., etc. So uh, as the summer days start to shorten, and we're feeling that now, now is the time to really um, get serious and start working on ourselves, on our midot, on our attributes, on who we are, how we behave toward one another, how we behave toward ourselves, how we behave toward Hashem. There's always what to work on. And even if we were able to burnish our our attributes and, and, and perfect ourselves a year ago, uh, there's no guarantee that we haven't um, uh, backslided, backslid a little bit, uh, that we need some more polishing once again. As, as, as good as it gets, as good as we get ourselves, there's always room for improvement. And um, it is a constant uh, daily 
uh, workout. But again, in the month of Elul, we get double, triple, quadruple serious uh, so that we will be prepared with no uh, surprises, no excuses, and be able to enter into the new year at the top of our game. So that is the month of Elul. We have lots to talk about concerning Elul, and we will be later uh, today, perhaps, certainly in the upcoming weeks. Once again, the uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday evening, Thursday, is actually the final day of this month of Av. Whenever there is a two-day Rosh Chodesh, the first day is the final day of the outgoing month. And the second day, in this case, Thursday evening, Friday, is the first day of the incoming month of Elul. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some nice photographs of the new moon, depending on the visibility. You know, just about less than two weeks ago, right, in the 15th of Av, Tuba Av, we are talking about one of the special things about Tuba Av what, is that it was in the time of the Migda, Migdash, in the time of the Holy Temple, it was the final day that people could bring wood in uh, to be burnt on the altar, the final day of the year, and that is because following Tuba Av, the weather gets more humid, the atmosphere gets more humid, and uh, it is much more difficult to, to properly dry wood, so the wood could get wormy, and uh, that would not be appropriate for the altar. So uh, to protect against that possibility, uh, they would not accept any more what basically was an offering, because it was a gift to the temple for the service, an offering of wood. And I got to tell you that, um, you know, in Israel is a pretty, pretty dry climate here, and the summers are especially dry. I mean, we rarely have rainfall. Um, you know, shortly after, after Passover is concluded in the spring, we rarely have rainfall until um, maybe after Sukkot. Right, that's when we start to pray for rain again. That uh, following uh, um, a, a week, two weeks after the end of Sukkot, but um, this past week there has been a huge increase in the humidity. It's gotten very humid. Um, the days are getting shorter. We feel that, and the humidity has greatly increased. Uh, you know, in the summer you can hang out your your clothes on a line and come out an hour later and everything's dry, here you can hang them out and you've got to wait for the next day, the next afternoon, uh, when the humidity is at its lowest for the, for the clothes to actually be dry. So they weren't just uh, uh, making things up when they said that uh, following Tuba Av, uh, they no longer accept new wood to be brought to burn on the altar because of the humidity. It really does get more humid quickly here, and uh, it changes everything. This week's parsha, as we go deeper and deeper into the fifth and final book of the five books of Moses, the Hamisha Humshe Torah, as we say in Hebrew, the five books of the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and we're in, of course, Deuteronomy, Devarim in Hebrew, words, because these are the words of Moshe, in his final uh, farewell address to Israel, which, as we've mentioned many times, uh, took place over the final 37 days of his life. And he is now focusing on what it's going to be like when you, Israel, gets into the land of Israel uh, and sets up a, how to set up a, a Torah, a Torah-based, a Torah-centric society because Moshe himself will not be going in with Israel. And of course, we know the reason why. We're not going to get into that right now. But uh, so he's he's giving over many practical um, thoughts and also commandments for how to conduct yourselves on a national level, uh, also on the personal level, but uh, much emphasis on the national level, uh, civic level, and this week's Parsha, as we'll see, is all about uh, uh, the judiciary, the judicial system, judges, uh, the type of people who should become judges, the type of people who shouldn't become judges, 
uh, prophets, kings, and um, how society should deal with different things that come up, war, um, etc. So let's read the first few verses, first in Hebrew, then in English. Once again, we're in chapter 16, verse 18. Shoftim veshotrim titen lecha mechol she'arecha, asher Hashem melokecha noten lecha, lishvatecha veshavtu et ha'am mishpat tzedek. Lo tate mishpat, lo takir panim, velo tikach shochad ki hashochad yaver ene chachamim visalif divrei tzadikim. Tzedek tzedek tirdof lemaan tichye viyarashte et ha'aretz asher Hashem elokecha noten lach. Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities, which Hashem your God gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert judgment, you shall not respect someone's presence, and you shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make just words crooked. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. Judges, shoftim, and officers, shotrim in modern Hebrew, a shoter is a policeman. I don't think the, I don't think they really had policemen back in the day of uh, that we're that we're talking about. I think they had officers of the law. Let's say that uh, were officials who kept 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 uh, kept the peace, kept law and order, kept. They were, but they weren't. Uh, they weren't uh, shotrim. They weren't policemen who who pursued bad guys or whatever. Uh, so judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities. Actually, the Hebrew, which is translated as cities, is the sharech, which means in all your gates. Because cities had city gates. That's how everybody entered or exited the city. And uh, apparently that was where the judges would sit, in the gates. Uh, and so the... Um, performance of, of judgment was a very public very public affair it wasn't behind closed doors it wasn't hidden away from the eye of the of the of the interested uh, but very public there is another very very beautiful interpretation of this verse which is very elul uh, appropriate and very uh, getting ready for the high holidays that is Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur appropriate or it says your gates. What's a gate? A gate's an opening that allows things in or out. So what are the gates? What's a person's gates and, and their physiognomy? Your eyes, your ears, uh, your mouth. And so you should appoint judges and officers at your gates to make sure that you don't listen to Lashon Hara, to evil talk, to things, unkind things damaging things, detriment, detrimental things about others, uh, that you certainly don't speak those things. You guard your mouth. You guard your eyes from seeing things that are inappropriate. You guard your eyes from uh, haughtiness, from, you know, looking at others uh, uh, from a haughty, superior perspective. And so, yes, we need to be uh, in control, in charge of what goes in and what comes out. Uh, also, you know, in terms of our mouth, we, that we don't put uh, food that's inappropriate in our mouth. Certainly, uh, we keep kosher. We don't put things that aren't kosher. But we also eat responsibly. Uh, we don't behave as gluttons. And we make sure that uh, there's always something for others. So there's much to learn from this understanding of gates as our own personal gates uh, and much to gain from that if we take that seriously. In, th in this case, in our verse, it is very literally uh, speaking about city gates and real judges uh, that are pursuing justice. And again, that word justice, tzedek, comes up over and over. The uh, they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Um, you shall not pervert judgment. 
should not respect someone's presence, right? Someone is, you know, very uh, successful. You can't take, as a judge, you can't take that into account and say, well, this person's very successful, you know. They must, they must be on the side of justice or a person is very good looking or they look honest or they talk nice or um, they're important people. You know, this guy, he's, he's a, a civic leader, so, you know, let's give him a break here. No. And uh, also, you can't look at a person and say, this pers poor person is, is downtrodden, so we're just going to, you know, we're going to do him a favor here. Uh, this person could use a lift, you know, they could use some help here, so we're not going to really judge whether uh, justice is on their side or not. We're going to give him a break. No. You cannot do those things. You need to pursue justice. And again, justice is one of those pursuits that, um, you know, that's it's achieved in its attempt to be achieved. I don't know that we can ever uh, or often, uh, you know, expect to achieve perfect justice, if we even know what that is. But certainly judges need to be aiming for that. That needs to be their target. That needs to be their goal. And, um, you know, it's like horseshoes. They say uh, it's whoever comes closest. You have to come as close as you can. And it goes on. Uh, the bribe will do not accept the bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make, and again here it's, uh, it says, and make just words crooked. And actually the Hebrew says, visalev divrei tzadikim, which means will make crooked the words of the wise. Which means even wise people, uh, I'm sorry, make, make crooked the words of the righteous, even righteous people, even wise people, chacham, chachamim, can be perverted by bribery. Nobody is impervious to this. Uh, there's no person you can say, this person, you know, they're a judge, and because they have wisdom or because they have shown righteousness, uh, that we don't have to worry that they can lower their guards because they're never ever going to to uh, be tempted by by bribery or by favoring one or the other. No, even the righteous have to always be on their guard. And that's really what a righteous person is, not a person who has achieved a certain level that uh, makes them beyond, you know, beyond the reach of, of, of uh, stumbling, beyond the reach of, of making an error, beyond the reach of being, of being God forbid, uh, bribed or, or caused to pervert their judgment. No, every person needs to constantly be vigilant. The righteous especially, and judges always, always need to be vigilant, always need to be careful uh, in how they judge. And we read many times, and it's implied here as well, that it's really one of the main pillars that uh, a Torah society in Israel, that the, that the nation of Israel can, will survive and thrive. When there's no justice, um, it all goes it all goes down and it's always a struggle it's always a battle and in Israel today we um, have a very very uh, heated battle over the justice system uh, how judges are, are selected and um, there seems to be a lot of problems in the in the system that the current government is trying to correct uh, uh, raising, arousing tremendous opposition, um, but um, it's very important that that uh, we never grow lax in our in our in how we pursue justice. And I personally have seen tremendous uh, uh, instances of injustice and lack of justice. And it uh, worries me and bothers me very much because you know, we cannot afford that. Um, we need to be a just society and we need to have wise 
and righteous judges who, as the verse says, uh, tzedek, tzedek, tiradof, right? And uh, righteous is righteousness you shall pursue. Tzedek, tzedek. The fact that the Torah repeats this word uh, is, is, is proof of its, the emphasis and the concern and the importance of justice. Got no justice, you got nothing. The Parsha then goes on to talk about uh, idolatry, and again, all throughout Deuteronomy, Moshe returns to the subject of idolatry, of idol worship, of worshiping other gods, and apparently, uh, back in the day, s uh, certainly throughout the, the era of the first temple, um, the man's inclination toward idolatry was apparently super, super, super strong. And it was a constant, daily, massive effort to wean Israel off of idolatry. And of course, Israel was not unique. Uh, many nations, all the nations pursued idolatry. You, Israel was only unique in that uh, Israel had uh, a covenant with with the one true God, and so idolatry was unacceptable. So this was a struggle that that continued all throughout the era of the first temple, throughout the period of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judea, and um, it was not nearly as prominent uh, in the second temple era. And onward, of course, you know, much of the world today, perhaps most of the world today, is monotheistic and only believes in the one God. But um, we have to be careful because there's so many other things that um, are also idolatrous and have taken the place of the ancient, uh, you know, uh, gods of stone and wood and and clay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, I think one of the big idolatries in our world today is money and material things. There are people that, um, if they don't literally worship money, and I think some people do, um, they certainly hold money uh, and possessions, material things, as being more important than anything else. It's how they understand themselves. It's how they understand the world. It's how they understand their place in the world. That's that's their frame of reference, which is idolatrous. Because a frame of reference that places money or material things as the judge of who you are, what you achieved, where you're going, that's idolatrous. And I'm sure we could uh, list many other things, you know, certain... Uh, people can become politically idolatrous because they attach themselves to a political dogma uh, that even when it no longer uh, serves its intended purpose or, or is for the betterment of society, people become attached to it. It's, it becomes their defining quality. And so... They're pursuing an, 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 an idol. So again, just like uh, the judges have to be careful all the time, and just like we have to set up judges in our own gates, our own personal uh, eyes and ears and mouth, um, we have to be very careful that uh, we don't delegate parts of ourselves and certainly our relationship with with Hashem to other things, whether they're material things, material possessions, ideologies. Um, we have to be eternally vigilant. The Parsha goes on to discuss all sorts of things. Again, I mentioned the idolatry. It goes uh, how to deal with idolaters even if they are in the family. Uh, it's very harsh. There's no, the Torah doesn't give, a, there's no quarter for idolatry. Uh, it doesn't give too much uh, uh, 
mercy for idolaters because idolatry is very destructive uh it's nobody you know idolatry is like a a uh, a contagious a contagion it it doesn't sit by itself it spreads and it's destructive and it destroys society then the Torah in Parshat Shoftim goes on to talk about a king, right? So we know this famous passage. It's very interesting, and it's very, again, very relevant. When you come to the land that Hashem, your God, gives you and possesses and possess it and settle in it, and, it, and you will say, I'm reading now in chapter 17, verse 14, and you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a, yourself a king whom Hashem your God shall choose from among your brethren shall you set a king over yourself. You cannot place over yourself a foreign man who is not your brother. Only he shall not have too many horses for himself so that he will not return the people to Egypt in order to increase horses. For Hashem has said to you, you shall no longer return on this road again. And he shall not have too many wives so that his heart will will not turn astray and he shall not greatly increase silver and gold for himself it shall be that when he sits on the throne of his kingdom he shall write for himself two copies of this Torah in a book from before the Kohanim the Levites it shall be with him and he shall read it from all the days of his life so that he will learn to fear Hashem his God to observe all the words of this Torah and these decrees to perform them so that his heart does not become haughty over his brethren and not turn from the commandment right or left, so that he will prolong years over his kingdom, he and his sons amid Israel. Okay. Um, this is uh, not a commandment to set over yourself, Israel, a king, but it is a, a set of commandments that become... Um, active if Israel does set over itself a king and of course we know that when the people some hundred years from when Moshe was saying this to Israel uh, came to Shmuel and Samuel the, pro the, the, the prophet and said we want a king he was very uh, taken aback and very uh, uh, hurt that Israel would want a king. He said, God's your king. He said, God's not good enough. Um, and the fact is that uh, Israel had certain challenges, military challenges, right? The the police team, the Philistines, were, were becoming very strong at Israel's expense, and the people felt they needed a single leader. Uh, they needed to take their tribal system and uh, centralize it to have a single leader who could really unite them and lead them in battle. And that was their their reasoning. But um, Shmuel, Samuel, was, like I said, very uh, angry with Israel. And he basically told them all the downsides of having a king. King's going to draft your sons into the army. A king's going to tax you. A king will take your property when the property is, you know, he needs to build something, uh, needs to build a road. Um, things which, by virtue of the fact that he said them, we know that those were the rules of kings. He wasn't making something up. He wasn't making an idle threat. This is how it works. This is how it works, and this is how it works today. When we set up a, a central government, a central leader, we're, we're entering into a contract with that leader in which we give up some of our independence and our liberty and our property. And in return, he is supposed to provide uh, us with security and peace and, and righteousness, judgment. And that, again, is what this is really focusing on. Uh, the prohibition against having too many horses to gather too much wealth. I mean, we all see how that perverts um, perverts the judgment of our leaders who are supposed to be looking out for our common good. And, you know, how many... Let's just take the United States, democratic country, uh, where presidents maximum time they can serve as eight years, but how many presidents 
come out of office and if they don't come out of office already uh, multi multi millionaires then soon within years they've managed to generate millions and millions and millions of dollars of income from who knows what uh, books lectures um, TV uh, contracts and who knows what um, and it's kind of disheartening, isn't it, that the people who we've entrusted to lead us, we see, have this ulterior motive. And of course, just as respecting the wealthy can pervert the judgment of a judge, certainly pursuing wealth can pervert the judgment of a king. And of course, here it says that because it will lead you back to Egypt, right, in order to increase his horses, he might you know, Egypt had lots of horses. And so you need to turn to Egypt to increase your horses. But more than that, um, leaders can sell out their countries to other countries in order to uh, create greater personal wealth, greater uh, aggrandizement of their own selves. We've seen that happen so much. That is forbidden. And of course, uh, too many wives. I mean, today, uh, uh, except in certain um, Arabic countries here in the Middle East, uh, uh, polygamy is is no longer practiced. But back in the day, a king certainly could gain many wives and concubines, and there had to be a limit because they're also very distracting, at the least, and. Um, they they get the the ear of the of the king they can be very destructive we know that from king ah of ahab whose queen and jezebel uh, was an idolater and she uh led to the spread of tremendous idolatry in the land of israel so that is the second prohibition and of course should not greatly increase silver and gold for himself that uh, sort of overlaps with what we're saying about the the horses um, it's it's a problem it's a problem when you have a you have a president or a prime minister who who you look 10 years after they're out of office if they're still living humbly you know that um, they probably served uh, with humility as well um, and then finally it says it shall be that when he sits on the throne of his kingdom he shall write for himself two copies of this Torah in a book from before the Kohanim, the Levites it shall be with him and he shall read from it all the days of his life so that he will learn to fear Hashem, his God to observe all the words of this Torah and these decrees to perform them so that his heart does not become haughty over his brethren and not turn from the commandment right or left so that he will prolong years over his kingdom he and his sons amid Israel the Torah, the book of the law the king absolutely will learn later uh, in Deuteronomy that it is actually a commandment for every Jew to write a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll. And we'll talk about that uh, later, how that's done, how that's possible. Um, but in the case of the king, he had to write two, actually write them. One would be kept in his, in his treasure house, you know, in his... Uh, in his office, safe, safely guarded, but the other would always be with him, alongside him, wherever he went, so that it was always before him, so that uh, he would always act in accordance, and so that he would know always, and that we know a king is not above the law, not like other kings, right? The problem here is kings like other nations. Other nations had kings who were above the law, not in Israel. The king is subject to the same Torah that we are, and here is the music. I gotta go. Thanks for being with me. Temple Talk. <laughs>